God doesn't call the qualified, but He qualifies the called. In other words, He doesn't choose us based on our goodness, but He chooses us and then gives us His goodness. What a deal. That's what we're talking about today, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. This is now the end of my second week of teaching on the subject of the true nature of God, talking about how that God is actually a God of love, even though in the Bible there is a lot of harshness, a lot of punishment for sin, and things like this. People sometimes can't reconcile this, and they think, is God the God of this anger, or is He the God of mercy that we saw in Jesus? Will the real God please stand up? And I've been showing that primarily, now this is a generalization, and I'm going to go into more specifics, but I'm going from the general to the more specific. Generally speaking, the wrath of God is revealed in the Old Covenant. There was a period of time that God imputed people's sins unto them. But we now live in a New Covenant, and under this New Covenant, God's grace and mercy, His true heart and nature is revealed. And one of the reasons that people don't understand the grace of God is because they mix the Old Covenant and the New Covenant together and think that it's all just the same thing. No, it is two different ways, and the Old Covenant wasn't given to help us the way most people think it was given, actually to hurt us, to knock us down, to make us guilty. And I've been using some scriptures to verify this. I use, first of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56. It says, the strength of sin is the law. The law strengthens sin. Then 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 7 says, the law ministered death. Verse 9 says it ministered condemnation. Romans 3.19 says that the law stopped our mouth, took away all of our excuses and excuses and reasonings. And it also says in that same verse, Romans 3.19, that the law made us guilty before God. Then it says in Romans chapter 3, verse uh, 20, that uh, the law gave us knowledge of sin. So we've already talked about all six of those things. And every one of those things was given to just amplify sin. Not to help us overcome sin, but to help sin overcome us so that we would recognize our need for God and turn from self-righteousness. Now, I wish I had time to read through every verse in the book of Romans. Someday I'm going to come back and teach that again. I've already taught it on our program, and it's powerful. But let me just highlight a few verses here as we go through the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 4... And in verse uh, 14, it says, For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Man, this shows very clearly that the law wasn't for the purpose of getting right with God. The only way you could get right with God was through faith. Just putting faith in what Jesus did for you. If you were trying to earn right standing with God, then you would make faith void in the promise of none effect. It's not going to happen. Nobody is ever going to stand before God and be accepted based on your goodness. You have to humble yourself and receive salvation as a gift. And then in the next verse it says, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Now here's a seventh reason out of just these few scriptures I've used. Another purpose of the law is to release wrath. Where there is no law, there is no transgression, or you could say no wrath. The law isn't made for a righteous man. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8 and 9 says that. So, the law isn't made for a Christian. The Christian isn't under the law. Galatians chapter 3, we've already used those verses. So therefore, you could say that there is no wrath towards a Christian. God has already placed all of His wrath upon Jesus, not only for your past tense sins, but even your present and future tense sins. If you have truly made Jesus your Lord, He forgave all of your sins, past, present, and even future tense, when you got born again, and God is not going to be angry with you. It says over in Isaiah chapter 54, it says, This is as the covenant of uh, Noah, 
unto me, for as I have sworn that I'd never again be, uh, never again destroy the earth with a flood, so have I sworn that I would never be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee again. God said that once you enter into this new covenant with Jesus as your Savior, God is never going to be angry with you. There would never be any wrath. We have been redeemed from wrath because wrath only comes on people who are under the law. Man, that's good news. This is so radically different. You know, I was raised in a religious system that once you came to the Lord and got born again, they didn't believe that you could lose your salvation. They believed once you were saved, you were always saved. So they didn't preach an extreme uh, of this. But they did preach that even though you may not go to hell after you're born again, that God is still going to be angry at you. God will withdraw His blessing on your life. He will withdraw His fellowship. Uh, there's many times that I felt like, you know, God was a million miles away and I just knew it was because I'd sinned. I hadn't witnessed to somebody. I hadn't read the Bible the way I should. I failed to pray. And that's the reason that God had forsaken me. That all came through a teaching that the Scripture here would be calling law, believing that God deals with us based on our conformity to some set of rules. And there's many times that I felt like God had forsaken me. I remember one time over in Vietnam, I just felt like I was such a failure as a witness that I just knew God had put me on the shelf. God had never used me because I wasn't worth using. Well, it was true that I wasn't worth using. But the good news, the nearly too good to be true news is that God's never had anybody qualified working for Him yet. God doesn't use the qualified. He qualifies the called. And He just made me uh, accepted with Him by grace, not based on what I'd done. And so, anyway, the law works wrath. If you are under the law, you are going to feel the wrath, the displeasure of God to some degree. The ultimate, the extreme Pentecostals believe every time you sin, you lose your salvation and you're damned to hell. Even if you went 20 years walking with God and do one little sin, boom, you go to hell. There's a man here in Colorado Springs. I believe he's dead now, but he was a preacher. And he taught that if you went 56 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone, and if you had a car wreck and uh, died, you would go to hell because you broke the law. And some of you think, oh man, I don't believe that. Well, you don't believe it because you go 56 or above. But if, you know, let's just say that, let's say that you committed adultery and then died and didn't have time to repent of that, would you go to hell for committing adultery? Well, yeah. Uh, an adulterer would never enter into the presence of God. Well, the Bible says in James 2.10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. You know what? If you are trying to earn right standing with God based on your performance, then it doesn't matter if you're going 56 in a 55 mile an hour zone or if you commit adultery or if you lie or if you steal and then die and have that sin without being confessed. All of it has already been paid for. There's no difference as far as your eternal redemption goes. And I know that there's millions of people that probably choked on that. And you're saying, well, I, there are so many other people say this. I can't help what other people say. I'm telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of breaking the whole thing. That's what the Bible says. Now that may not be what your denomination says. That may not be what your grandmother taught you. That may not be what a lot of other people say. But the Bible ought to be absolute authority in your life. And you need to turn over there and read James 2.10 for yourself. And then all of these other scriptures. The law works wrath. The law is what released the wrath of God. And I've already used bunches of scriptures to show you that we are no longer under the law. Let me skip over and read some more verses out of Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, it says in verse uh, 5, it says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now here again are some statements about what the law produced. The law gave sin motion. 
or made it come alive, as it says in just a couple of verses on down here. So the law, I've already said the law strengthened sin, the law condemned, the law killed, the law stopped your mouth, the law made you guilty, the law gave you knowledge of sin, the law worked wrath. Now it says that the law gave motion to sin. It enabled sin to move and have power to accomplish things. And the fruit of that was that it brought forth death. The law is actually what allowed death to start ruling and reigning in our lives. You know, again, I just don't know how anybody who believes that the Bible is true can take issue with what I'm saying. Now, I'm aware that there's some other scriptures that may look somewhat contrary to this, and I'm working my way through it, and I'm explaining them. But how can you take issue here with all of these negative things that it said that the law was accomplishing? Most people believe that the law was a super positive thing. It wasn't positive. It was negative. It was given to steal, kill, to destroy, to condemn, to stop your mouth, to make you guilty, to release the wrath of God, to give motion to sin, to bring forth death. Man, if you understand this, why don't you turn from the law and turn towards the grace of God by faith? It's amazing. It's amazing to me how I was deceived. And I just basically was taught this stuff. I was indoctrinated it and swallowed it because it was just told to me so often. But the Bible, it, this is abundantly clear that this law, thou shalt not, and you're going to be punished and judged if you do, that that law was not given to bring you to God, but rather was given to show you your need for God, to drive you to your knees so that you would call out in mercy to God. That's the only thing that will ever reconcile you to God and give you relationship. And because people haven't been clear on this, they have been trying to relate to God based on this performance. And the truth is, none of us perform well enough, and your own conscience is going to condemn you of that, judge you of that, and it's not that you're going to doubt the existence of God, you're going to doubt the willingness of God to fellowship with someone like you. So I was reading out of Romans chapter 7, and in verse 5, it says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law. How clear can you get it? Now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now this is basically the same thing that was said just a couple of chapters earlier in Romans chapter 3 verse 20 where it says, By the law is the knowledge of sin. This is saying that I hadn't have known what sin was if the law hadn't have come. The law gave us knowledge of sin. And then it says in verse 8, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Man, this is nearly... This is nearly mind-boggling. This is so different than what most of us have thought. Most of us have thought that the law was given to kill sin. But the Bible is saying exactly the opposite. That the law was, I mean, sin was dead until the law came. And then look at the next verse. It says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Sin actually came alive when the commandment comes. You know, I know that some of you right now are struggling, saying, but I thought it was just the opposite. I thought that on my own, I am a sinner and I'm just bent on sin. And so the law gave, the Lord gave the law so that I would quit sinning and so that I could overcome sin. No, the law actually made sin come alive on the inside of you and you died. That's exactly what these verses are saying. It goes on to say in the very next verse, it says, And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. 
So the commandment, the law, actually produced death. This is the exact same thing that was said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, where it says the ministration of death written and engraven in stones. So the law didn't help us kill sin. It helped sin come alive. Now again, I know some people are saying, well, why would God give something that would make sin come alive? This doesn't make sense. Here's the logic behind it. It's... Sin had already killed us. Sin was already like a tumor on the inside of us, a cancer, and it was eating our lunch. It was destroying us. We were dying from it. But because we didn't feel any pain, we were under the deception that, you know what, I, it must be over. I must be okay. But inside, this sin was growing and festering, and we were damned to hell because we were sinners. But we didn't recognize it. We had dulled ourselves to the pain by being occupied with everything else. So God basically gave something that made that tumor, that sin on the inside, just come alive and begin to grow and multiply, and all of a sudden pain and problems begin to happen to let us know that, hey, we aren't out of the woods. The cancer isn't gone. It's still there. You know, pain isn't pleasant, but pain actually is a positive thing in our life if it's used properly. Again, if you could imagine a person having a cancer, but not aware that it's there, and so they don't take any action to deal with it, well then that cancer could just grow and multiply. If we didn't have pain in our body, if we didn't have swelling or something that clued us that there was something wrong on the inside, then we'd never get treatment, we'd never deal with it, we'd never pray about it, and it would shorten our life and kill us. So, in a sense, when we start having pain and all of these symptoms come up, did you know it's actually a blessing because it lets us know that something is wrong so that we could deal with it? Well, in a similar way, we all were infected with sin, but we had deceived ourselves by being preoccupied with other things and looking around and, you know, we, everybody else is as miserable as we are. And so we just thought, well, I must be okay. But no, here comes the law, and all of a sudden the law made sin come alive. It made pain come to you. You started seeing how deadly that sin was in your life, and it made you turn from it. And you know, also, here's a, here's a point. Here's another illustration to make this point. Why would God make sin come alive? Because it was already there, and a little bit of sin had destroyed you. You were already separated from God, but you needed to see how far separated you were. And so, for those people who were self-righteous, thinking, I'm a really pretty good person. I know I'm not perfect, but I'm pretty good. You know what? When you give the law... It makes sin come alive on the inside of you. And, and it's, here's a comparison. It's just like when I was a kid. I remember if you wanted a kid to do something, I remember one time trying to get a kid to walk across a log that was across a creek, and we knew he was going to fall in, but we were daring him to do it, and he didn't want to do it. And in Texas, you just say, I double dog dare you. <laughs> and once you do that, that's the worst insult that could ever be given. And you know what? He did it, and he fell in the creek. He knew he shouldn't have done it, but he was dared. It, we, in a sense, said, thou shalt not do it. You cannot do it. And when you tell a person that they cannot do something, there's, on the in, there's something on the inside of people that just rises up and says, bless God, I shall do it. That's the way God made us. I don't believe he made us to be ruled over by rules and regulations and cans and cannots. And stuff, and there's just something on the inside of people that resents being told what you can do. So God, knowing that that was our nature, and we were deceived into thinking, I'm all right, I don't believe I have any sin on the inside of me. God says, I'll bring it out. And all he had to do was say, thou shalt not. And all of a sudden, sin came alive, and you found out that there was this terrible lust in you that you weren't even aware of until somebody told you you couldn't do it. And the purpose of that was to wake you up and see that, you know what? Sin is still alive. That cancer is still growing on the inside of you. You need a miracle. You know, I was running a race one time, and this was a 6K or a 10K race, a 6.2 mile race. And I had turned in a personal record already. I mean, I had given it all I had, and I was just about out of steam. And I was only a quarter of a mile from the end of the race and a guy started to pass me and I'm a competitor some of you 
don't know me well enough to know that, but I, you know, I'm just a competitor. I've never thrown a game of anything. I'm not a sore loser, but <laughs> my dad taught me that second place is first loser. And so, you know what, I always try and win. And so here I was, I'd given it all I had. I'd just run as hard as I could. And this guy started to pass me, and he got a couple of strides in front of me, and he looked back over his shoulder, and he said real sarcastically, he says, you could do better than that. And you know, when he said that, he insulted me. He was, he was putting me down, and it was just like he was saying, Thou canst not do any better than that. And I mean something on the inside of me rose up. You know, I never saw that show, The Incredible Hulk, but I heard people talk about it. I saw little uh, advertisements on TV for it, and that's what it reminded me of. All of a sudden, here I'd given it everything I had, and when he started to pass me, I tried to keep up, but I just didn't have it. But when he insulted me, when he says, You can't keep up, all of a sudden, it's like the Incredible Hulk. My adrenaline kicked in. I mean, boom, I took off. I found energy that I didn't know I had. And I probably, in the last quarter of a mile of that 6.2-mile race, I bet you I beat this guy by 100 yards. I don't know where that energy came from. And when I crossed the finish line, Jamie was there. I fell in her arms. I thought I was going to die. I, I don't know... Where this came from, under normal circumstances, I couldn't have done it. But when somebody said, thou shalt not, something on the inside of me rose up and said, bless God, I shall. You know what? God made all of us that way. I was playing golf with a guy not too long ago, and we are really competitive. He was two strokes ahead of me on the 17th hole, and we had a 250-yard shot across water. And he was ahead, so I was going for it. I pulled out my three wood. He was going to lay up and play it safe. And you know what I did? I did this same thing. I insulted him. He says, are you going to try and go across the water? I said, sure, anybody but a sissy would. I said, you're a wuss. I said, you are just wimping out on me. And I began to insult this guy. And you know what this guy did? He pulled his three wood out, tried to kill it, knocked it into the water, wound up getting over in these weeds, got some chemicals on him, got the hives, started crying, and, and you know what? I beat him by three strokes in two holes. And later he says, D you just intimidated me into that. And I, I did. I absolutely did. And you know what? God, knowing that we're like that, that's the way that he showed us. You think you've overcome sin. You don't think you have any desire for sin. You think you're pure and clean of sin and that it's not a problem. He says, all right, thou shalt not, you cannot do this. And all of a sudden that sin nature came alive on the inside of us. It revived and we died. And you know what? That was a positive thing in the sense that it showed us we haven't changed. You know what? I thought I was able to overcome this sin on my own, but I didn't. And it makes us throw ourselves on the mercy of God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the purpose of the law. If you would use the law for that, great. But the problem has been that we've been using the law for people who've already come to God, who've already committed themselves to God, and we're making them sin conscious. And by doing so, we're releasing the wrath of God, making sin come alive. We're giving motion to sin. We're enabling sin in our life by all of this rules and do's and don'ts instead of telling people about the goodness and the grace of God. Man, I've got so much more to share on this, but we're going to continue this on our programs next week, so I encourage you to listen in. Also remember that we have brand new product out on this. It's just an amplification, an expansion of what I've already taught on the true nature of God, and this would really help you. So please call or write and receive this brand new product. Listen as our announcer gives you that information, and then join me again on Monday as we continue the gospel truth. 